Good morning. I think we'll go ahead and get started. We want to get started right around 8 o'clock, and it's, it is 8 o'clock. Uh, I want to welcome you to the Sports Medicine Update. My name is Brad Brown. I'm the Director of uh, Outreach Athletic Training for Memorial Hermann. I would like to take this opportunity to thank every one of you for coming. Uh, I think we put together a great uh, workshop. I shouldn't say we, because I didn't do it. Uh, I want to thank Bob Marley, who's put this together and worked very hard at doing it. Also, uh, Abby and Brad here at Second Baptist for arranging all this. I know this is a lot of work. And uh, if you have any questions or problems, Second Baptist, they're the ones that can answer this for you. But, you know, I think it's all great. It, it looks like it's a great setup. It's been here before. I think this is kind of a rerun. So many of you have been in here and, and done this before. So uh, thank you again for coming out. Um, I think we've got a great two days uh, of, of workshop. I think that it's, you know, the timing's interesting in that the NATA is going to be actually the end of this week. Um, SWAT is coming in here the next month. So, you know, we've got a lot of opportunities, but so we appreciate really everybody coming out and, and doing this for this point in time. I think one of the things that's interesting too about um, these workshops today, and I want to give Bob a lot of credit for this, the EBP thing for the NATA is a real pain in the rear. Uh, I think everybody's finding that out over how that all works. Um, Bob has worked endlessly for probably four to five months to get this EBP credit. And you know what? We got approved Friday afternoon at 4.30 for two hours of EBP. So that is our, um, it will happen with the concussion stuff. It's the last thing on the, on the agenda for today. There's several things on there that you have to do, and, it, and it, it requires you signing in and out to justify or follow the rules of EBP. So uh, we will ask you to do that as we go through. Um, and it's, it's not us, it's, it's the, the way it's set up. So just so everybody kind of knows, there are some rules. We'll kind of drive you through that as we go. Uh, but we do get two hours of EBP, so that's the good thing. Um, restrooms, if you go back out the back door, they're going to be located back to the left, kind of right by the doors where you came into the building. Um, there are Memorial Hermann people around. All of our staff is, or I should say all of our staff, most of our staff is wearing Memorial Hermann shirts, and a lot of us have blue shirts. So if you have any questions, any of us are around, we'd be happy to answer those questions. Cell phones, let's put them on vibrate. Um, Please don't, you know, interrupt our speakers and, and so on. So if you have a cell phone, please put it on vibrate for us. If you want to visit, you're more than welcome to step outside the door and visit the hallway. Let's try to keep it down to a minimum in the room so you're not disturbing the speakers. Um, sign in each day. Tomorrow there will also be a um, sign-in sheet. You need, you'll have to sign in each day. After today, you'll have to sign out for your EBPs. So make sure at the end of the day you sign out with us so we, that way you get credit for your EPPs. Um, Bob wrote all this stuff out for me, so I, he knew I'd screw this up. Uh, there's also sheets in the back of the form, or forms in the back of your booklets for uh, PTs. And uh, so you'll have to fill out those evaluation forms. I'm going to back up the EBP. Part of the EBP rules, if you haven't taken any of the EBP tests, uh, part of that to get credit for it is you have to evaluate the class. Same thing it goes with this. So you're going to have to do an evaluation before you get the credit for the, that class. So just remember there's a lot of little rules for that. Uh, if you're missing handouts, there's going to be a, a slide showing where you can go to uh, Google, Google Drive. You can pick up all, uh, all this information here things missing, you'll, you'll be able to get those. Uh, if you have any questions, again, ask any of us in the blue shirts. I shouldn't say any of us. Don't really ask me because this is my first time through, so I don't have a lot of the answers yet. Uh, Bob put me down as the guy in charge of complaints. Me with another guy, he's in a Aruba or someplace, so I guess you're stuck with me. So if you have complaints, you can come to me, and I'll do my best to get them worked out for you. Um, I think that we shouldn't have too many, though, because I think this is a great setup. I think it's going to work really well. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions or concerns, please ask them, but enjoy the day. 
Um, our first speaker, or he's going to enter, uh, at least do our welcome for us, is Dr. Walter Lowe. Dr. Lowe is our, our medical director for uh, uh, UT Orthopedics and Memorial Hermann. He is our outreach uh, medical director for our outreach, and he controls or looks over us and makes sure we're doing the right things and helps coordinate us with our physicians. Uh, but he's going to come up and do our, uh, our welcome. So with that, Dr. Lowe. Thanks, Brad. I, I don't need any notes. No. So uh, that, thanks, for, uh, thanks for coming today. I'm uh, sorry I'm not giving a talk. I told Bob I was supposed to be in Aspen on, on vacation today, but something came up, so I'm stuck in town for a few more days. But anyway, thanks, everybody, for coming as usual. Um, there's a few new people in the outreach program. You just met Brad Brown. Uh, Brad's, uh, in, in his first year with us, was the head athletic trainer at uh, the Tennessee Titans and the Houston Oilers for uh, all of you guys that remember the Oilers. And Brad's actually the guy that opened the door to give me my break uh, into this. And so he, he's a great guy. I hope you all get to know him. And, uh, you know, all organizations now that I run a big one are all about having the right people on board. And Brad Brown is, is the right people for sure. Also new to the outreach program is Coach Bob Gillis. Uh, uh, from El Campo, who uh, I don't know how many of you know, but I'd love you all to meet him today. Again, he's just one of the right people. I've known Bob ever since I uh, came to Houston and used to drive to Horton and drive to El Campo for football games and eat barbecue after the football games. And actually, those were some of the most fun times I've had in my career uh, taking care of high school football. So it's a lot of fun, and I'm excited to have Bob in the fold, and we're just we're just kind of working out his job description because I said you can't have too many good people and he definitely uh, is, is somebody I want to have here. I think you have a good program. There's a lot of young surgeons and young therapists talking to you and uh, I think this is a rising group of stars you're going to see, uh, you know, today, you know, especially the breakout sessions. I think the dry needling by uh, Chris Juno, I think Ryan's uh, return to play in ACL are going to be very good uh, breakouts and those are two things that I think are changing. You know, the dry needling fairly new and the return to play I think our biggest place where we turn our heads at the wrong time and so we're trying to objectively start predicting when it's safe for kids to return to play and it's not at the times we all think it is right here so please, please pay attention to that. I think you're going to see a mindset of uh, just like we're trying to protect people from concussions and everything else, I think we have to protect our athletes from themselves sometimes. And so uh, it's going to be a whole new lear learning process, I think, as we go out there because as Dave Crumby is talking tomorrow about the revision ACLs and the recurrent tears, especially in the high school athlete, this is, a, this is just a giant problem. Uh, for us in sports medicine right now. So I don't think it'll be the same old, same old. I'm happy it's not the same old, same old here. And I really thank all you guys for coming. And we're going to start with Mark uh, Prasarn, who is uh, our head of spine at UT. Uh, Mark um, is very into the on-field management of spinal injuries, which he's going to uh, talk to you about today. He's well published in moving the spinal cord in injured uh, player, and he's been a real asset to us uh, at the Texans. Mark? Thanks for the introduction, Walt. Um, and I'd like to thank Bob Marley and the rest of the program committee for inviting me to come talk to you all today. Um, I certainly appreciate being the first talk, and uh, we have a full attentive audience at this point. Um, you know, I also think you know this is my personal interest, and, and have a lot of uh, spent a lot of time in the lab, and as well as on the field, helping take care of spine injuries and trying to find better ways to do so or safer ways to do so. Um, you know, I, I think this is an important talk, not just because of it's my personal bias, but I think that the two scariest, most devastating injuries you are going to learn about, you know, now and throughout your careers are going to be closed head injury, and probably cervical spine injuries. So I think this is an important topic. Okay, uh, I don't have any disclosures or any conflicts of interest to pertinent to this talk. Do you have another advancer or do you want me to just tell you? 
Right, now it's working, actually, it seems to be. Anyway, the last slide was just uh, people from my lab that have helped me do a lot of these studies. Um, this is what I gave you all as a handout. Um, what this is is uh, an outline of uh, the National Athletic Trainers Association's new protocol or guidelines for uh, dealing with spinal injuries or emergency situations. Um, I was fortunate enough to be asked to be part of the uh, physician and athletic training team that came up with these guidelines. Um, it will be published, I think, in the next few months. Um, one thing I will do is once it's published, I'll make sure uh, I get it to Bob Marley and we can get it distributed to you all. Um, maybe next year if I get asked to come back and talk, we'll go over this specifically, um, you know, what our recommendations are. What, what I'd really like to focus on today um, is a, a few of the points here, uh, but specifically what to do with, with spine precautions. Um, and then down here, number five, we're going to talk about, you know, basically how to safely move a patient. Um, we're going to talk about log rolling and how I don't think that's the ideal method and that there's alternatives. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about collars and rigid mobilization devices, specifically uh, long spine backwards. So this was a publication that came out a few years ago, and I'm not sure how familiar all of you are with the current um, things going on with as far as management of trauma patients or, you know, in, in your case, uh, spine injured athletes or, you know, but basically this paper came out uh, in 1998, so it's kind of old. Um, but for some reason, there's a lot of new proposals being made by the American College of Surgeons and a lot of emergency medicine personnel, including the physicians as well as EMS. Um, but based on this study, um, there's a lot of push to try to get rid of spine boards and even potentially cervical collars. Um, fortunately, again, I was part of uh, the NATA's uh, protocol uh, team, and we are not getting rid of these things at this point, but I just put this up to, to make you all aware of potential changes in the future. Um, this is a very weak study. Um, it's basically a comparison of uh, an EMS or a level one trauma center in New Mexico compared to a level one trauma center in Malaysia of all places. And basically the reason they chose those two places is uh, one of the authors is in New Mexico and they, they do exactly what we do here. They put people on long spine backwards and they put collars on, and do spinal precautions. Whereas in Malaysia, they don't do any of that. They basically just grab you, throw you on a stretcher and take you to the hospital. So they only had like 300 patients in the Malaysia group and 120 in the New Mexico group. Basically what they showed was there was no difference in um, neurologic deterioration. So that's the goal here. That's what we're all talking about. So if somebody has a spine injury, we're trying to prevent them from getting worse, right? We're trying to protect the spinal cord and the neural elements and prevent further deterioration. The problem with that is, so they've got, a, you know, around, you know, 450 patients total. Um, only one out of a thousand spinal injuries are unstable. And those are the ones that we're really worried about. Those are the ones where things can move, bone fragments, a herniated disc, whatever, and cause neurologic damage. So this study is so underpowered, it's unbelievable. And yet this is what's driving all those potential changes. And I just put this up to kind of make you aware. And you know, this, this, is, a, this is a personal story of mine. Um, this was my sort of senior mentor in residency at the University of Miami. His name's Garrett Couples. He's a great guy. You know, he was sort of all-American, you know, hero guy. He was a lifeguard. Um, when he was in med school in Philadelphia, he actually uh, jumped into a frozen water to save somebody's life who'd fallen in. He was on the Oprah Winfrey show as a result. Um, you know, he's a great guy. You could see him when he was young here. And basically, he had an accident or a fall off a balcony. He was neurologically intact, was able to walk after the accident. And I think, you know, I don't know if he hit his head or what the deal was. You know, he's a sports-trained orthopedic surgeon. Um, and basically, you know, his parents were there, didn't ask for them to call EMS or whatnot, walked up to his apartment, got in bed, got up out of bed and dislocated T11, T12, and he's a permanent paraplegic now at this point. Um, the sad thing was he didn't have any disability, he hasn't been able to work, and then some really brilliant engineering students from the University of Wisconsin built them this chair, which basically allows him to get upright and he can operate again. So he's kind of found new life recently, um, but this is a really sad story, you know, personal to me. It shows that spinal precautions are important, right? So, so I think if EMS had been called for him and he'd been placed on a board and brought to an adequate trauma center and treated by a spine surgeon, he probably would be walking today and wouldn't be paralyzed. So I think, you know, those recommendations of getting rid of spine boards and spinal precautions are crazy. And, you know, one, one thing that's been shown is that prior to having spinal precautions, you know, initiated, 
they, basically all patients with spinal cord injury showed up complete, meaning they had no function, they never recovered, nothing. Um, and then thereafter, that, that ratio, complete to incomplete, started to favor incomplete patients because I think we were protecting the neural elements and doing a good job. So just wanted to touch a little bit about that. And then uh, we're going to move on a little bit to talk about some of the research I've done and my recommendations to you all. Um, but, you know, basically 2% of trauma patients have a cervical spine injury. And we'll talk a little bit about airway management and because 10% of these patients will require some type of advanced airway management. And you all could potentially be involved with that along with EMS. Um, as far as catastrophic spinal cord injuries, they are rare. But, you know, my point is just like my friend, you know, you, you don't want to miss one. You know, you want to protect the neural elements. You want this guy to be walking and not end up like him. As far as sports injuries, it's the number four cause of spinal cord injury in the U.S. today. Um, approximately 8% of spinal cord injuries in, from 2005 to 2010 were caused by sports. Uh, football is the number one, uh, followed by wrestling. Uh, looking specific at the NFL, uh, the study was published. Um, so there are a significant number of spinal injuries. 12% uh, of these were non-spine or pelvic fractures. They, basically, they just looked at the whole axial skeleton together. Um, you know, the fortunate thing is that very few were catastrophic spinal cord injuries, but, you know, the point is you don't want to mismanage a single one of these, and every step in management is critical. Should you all be concerned? You know, I, I kind of already prefaced that. I think that, you know, this and closed head injury are, are really what we, you know, really need to manage appropriately, in addition to all sports injuries, but these are the ones where the consequences are really dire, and, and you know, this can result in catastrophic disability with severely high cost to society and to the patient and their family. Um, it's been estimated to be about $14.5 billion for spinal cord injury in the U.S. annually. Um, again, we talked about football and wrestling are the number one, number two causes, but there are other sports that you know, certainly have their fair shares of significant spinal injuries. Um, you know, and then one critical point here is that, you know, and, and I've seen this and we'll talk about a case next, it really does change you know, what you do to, as far as the patient goes. So it's been shown that almost up to 30% of spinal cord injury patients can get worse under the care of medical personnel. So you know, maybe we're not doing things well and maybe it's time for change and that's what I would propose. Uh, but in addition, this just shows that it's really important what we do. Uh, this is just a case that like, I'd like to demonstrate that bad things do happen when doctors and other medical care and athletic trainers and everybody else gets involved. You know, no matter how seasoned of a veteran you are, bad things can happen. This was a young patient that I was consulted on as a second opinion after he had been injured. Initially taken to an outside, another hospital, brought to the medical center. Um, the, another spine surgeon had seen the patient and decided to put the patient in a halo. They were neurologically attacked when they first came in the hospital. Um, and then post halo placement with several adjustment x-rays, uh, the patient became a complete quadriplegic, um, had to be intubated emergently underwent surgical stabilization, which I would have argued would have been necessary for this to begin with, and then the patient died a month later from respiratory compromise. So this is a terrible story. Um, you know, these are the things we're really trying to avoid. This study actually prompted me to publish a study looking at better ways to put halos on. Um, but you know what, success stories happen. Uh, this is a 15-year-old that uh, was doing, was you know, in a tackling drill at practice and spear tackled uh, one of his teammates. Um, and you can see he's got a jumped facet or dislocation here at C3, C4. Um, we got him reduced quickly, which I think is critical in incomplete spinal cord injuries. Basically, he couldn't move his right side. He was hemiplegic or had a brown sick heart syndrome. Um, this is his post-operative MRI and you can see the damage to the cord. Um, here is over at tier rehab and he's actually made a full recovery. He has a little bit of you know, tingling numbness he complains about in his hands still, but he's got normal hands, can write normally, play sports, he's playing soccer now, um, he's done well. So success stories happen. We all know about Kevin Everett, he got hurt when I was actually in upstate New York practicing, and obviously he's a pretty big success story as well. Um, but you know, things like this, you know, being patients being brought down on their ICU beds and stretchers and things prompted me to kind of think about what's going on and are there better ways to move spine injured patients and things. And this is sort of the current paradigm is that, you know, ATLS protocol says we should log roll patients and you know, I'm going to show you that there's better ways. Um, but, you know, again, so my, my, my personal bias is that log rolling is suboptimal. Um, this is contrary to traditional teaching. It's contrary to currently taught ATLS protocols. 
Um, and, and I would say that it's not necessary in blunt trauma patients because, you know, the argument by the general surgeons is that if it's a penetrating trauma, you have to inspect their back and make sure there's no, you know, bullet holes or entrance wounds, whatnot. Um, but, you know, I think in a blunt trauma patient, it's applicable and I don't think we need to log roll patients. Um, you know, we, we've been, we've, it's been shown not by just my lab group, but other authors as well, that it can be harmful. Um, the one caveat I would say, especially in this arena, is that a lot of times we found or most often it seems if somebody's badly injured in an in a athletic arena, that they're found face down. And I would say in that situation, you have no choice, right? You've got to get them face up. One thing I would say, and, and we've looked, we're looking at this lab, probably the safest way to do so is to just log roll them right onto a board. So if somebody's down and they're not moving and you think they have a significant injury, I would just place a board next to them and log roll them up supine. And I, I think that that's the best we can do. Uh, no real other options. Um, I had a good video of this, but we don't have video today, but no, no, not a big deal. But this is my mentor, Glenn Rectine, and he's got uh, one of the cadavers in our lab. What we do is we make unstable spine injuries and we measure the motion in between the vertebral segments where the injury is. Um, but basically, he's picking that gurney up six inches and just dropping it onto a hard floor. It's pretty dramatic on the video. You can see the thing recoil off the ground. And, and what the point here is, is that that produces less motion to that unstable spine than log rolling a patient under a controlled situation with trained individuals like this. And we have, this is the data to show it. This is sort of one plane of motion of the, of the neck during this type of movement. Is, so here you can see, this is the log roll and you can see how much motion there is. And this is actually that dropping the gurney six inches on the ground. And it does have a pretty significant spike here, but it's a heck of a lot of motion that what happens when you log roll somebody. Here it is in rotation plane, and here it is in lateral bending. So, you know, again, so I, I don't know about you, but if I had an unstable spine, I really don't want to be dropped to the ground on the gurney, and I think I'd be pretty unhappy if that happened. But actually being log rolled, which is what most of the time we do, is actually even um, what we propose as an alternative uh, is, is a, what we call, it used to be called a six plus person lift and, and the recent publication and the publication coming out in the NATA guidelines, or we're going to call it the eight person lift now. I think it makes a lot more sense. I don't know where, who came up with six plus to begin with because it takes 80 individuals. Um, you can see it being depicted here. So, that, so there's three individuals on each side with their hands together, um, just basically. And then uh, the most important person at the head doing manual inline stabilization you basically just levitate the patient off the ground six to eight inches, and then the eighth person slides the board under. Um, and basically, we've shown that in a bunch of studies to show, you know, during application and, and then during board removal that there's less motion and it's better than a log roll. And, and I would suggest, you know, that, that you all uh, get together with your teams and learn how to do this. And I think, you know, it's, it's the safest way to get somebody on the board or off the board. Um, as far as looking at somebody with football equipment on, because that's always a challenge, we went back to the lab and recently uh, just looked at that data. Um, this is accepted to Open Journal of Sports Medicine, so it should be published in a few months. But basically, we just padded up a cadaver and did the same study over again. And, and there was less motion in all planes, and it was actually statistically significant for lateral bending, medial lateral translation. So it's a better maneuver than log rolling, even if you have football pads in place. Um, we've done a bunch of other studies and published a bunch of other things looking at, you know, moving patients in the hospital and whatnot. Um, this is the, the most recent study that I published looking at this. And basically, it's uh, looking at a trauma patient or a sports injured athlete with an unstable cervical injury. And so we wanted to look at from the time of injury, when medical personnel take care of the patient to the time of surgery, are there better ways of moving the patient rather than using traditional log roll maneuvers? Um, and, you know, again, sort of the same background data of why we decided to do this. But we felt there were a lot better um, potential alternatives to log rolling, and that's what we used. So control group was log rolling, and then the alternative group was what we thought was to be the best case scenario. Um, and again, you know, we made the same unstable cervical injury uh, and went through the different motions. Um, we had five cadavers. Uh, injury level was C5, C6. That's the most common level to be injured in a blunt trauma victim. It's probably a little higher for most uh, football players. It's usually around C3, C4, um, but similar subaxial cervical spine. And we use 3D electromagnetic motion analysis to look at the movement between the two vertebra. During the maneuvers, um, we did put a collar on the patient uh, and, again, went through from the time of injury to the time of surgery. So we used, you know, spine boarding, um, moving the patient from bed to bed. We used something called an air pal mattress. Um, which, you know, basically it's like kind of this glide air inflated device, which is really smooth. Um, as far as turning the patient, because you can't leave somebody flat all the time, they'll get a decubitus ulcer. Um, so in the ICUs now, we have these special beds, which will tilt the patient 
um, versus what was traditionally done is just log rolling them and pasting pillows. And then this is a special table I have in my operating room. A lot of surgeries go going the back of the neck or the back of the spine, so you have to get them face down. So just flopping them over face down is pretty bad. And I, I think there's this is a much better alternative. It's basically my OR staff calls it the rotisserie maneuver. So it basically just kind of spin the patient with the table. And this is the recording of the motion. You know, the the, the sorry, the dark blue is the the best case scenario or what we thought was the best. And the pink is log rolling, and you can see flexion and extension. It looks better. Uh, same with axial rotation, much bigger spikes and movements with log rolling. And then same thing with lateral bending. And those are the three planes of angular motion that we looked at. Um, and this is the data analyzed, and you can see that the, the log rolling had more motion in, in every plane, and it was statistically significant for a couple of the maneuvers you know, over here, bed transfer, turning, turn prone, and, and approach significance for spine board removal. Uh, and axial rotation, we see similar results, but statistical significance for almost all planes except for the, or for almost all movements except for the bed transfer. And then as far as lateral bending, same, same trend in the data. When you add up all those movements, uh, looking at just the means or the average displacements, um, for all the three planes of motion, it was statistically less for using all what we thought were the better techniques versus log rolling. And then if you look at the maximal displacement, same thing. Know, over two to three times more displacement with log rolling. So we basically just proved again that log rolling is not the ideal and that there's better alternatives. And that's how, you know, if you get injured and you get under my care and this, you know, that this is how we do it. Um, limitations of the study, obviously cadavers are an ideal, um, but there's no way of doing this in live subjects. You can never get IRB approval to do something like this with live people. Um, we did only do a single injury pattern in the study, but we actually went back and repeated the study um, and published that in Journal of Neurosurgery Spine with a thoracolumbar injury. So the most two common injury levels for a blunt trauma patient are you know, mid-cervical and thoracolumbar, and basically both showed the same results. Um, one sort of caveat to this is like, we don't know exactly how much motion is detrimental to the cervical cord or to the spine. Um, but you know, the goal, and I, I think we'd all agree, is to minimize motion to as little as possible, and, and that's what we're looking to do, and that's what we're trying to show. Um, obviously, clinical studies would be better, maybe in an animal model, and that's something we've, we've talked about and are looking into. So in conclusion, um, you know, average displacements were significant, almost two times log, with the log roll maneuver, and the greatest displacements were even more, two to three times, uh, you know, with the log rolling versus the better technique. Um, I would argue that log rolling is not the most protective method, contrary to traditional teaching. Um, you know, and again, I think this is a really important topic given the morbidity of having a cervical injury or becoming a quadriplegic is very significant uh, to both the patient as well as family and society as a whole. Uh, I mentioned we'll talk a little bit about airway management. Um, what prompted us to look at this study, you know, so, so the way to get some, an uncautious patient's airway open, there's two proposed methods. One is a head tilt chin lift, the other is a jaw thrust maneuver. Uh, jaw thrust was proposed because it's less potentially less motion in the cervical spine. Uh, recent guidelines have said that we should not use the jaw thrust and it doesn't matter, and those are based on pretty poor studies. Uh, so we went in the lab and made an unstable upper cervical injury and looked at this, and the jaw thrust is way less motion than, than the head tilt chin lift. So our argument is that you still should do a jaw thrust to keep somebody's airway open if you have, they have a suspected cervical injury. Uh, we looked at intubation devices. This is maybe a little bit more appropriate for EMS, but you all will be helping you know, your EMS guys, if this ever comes to, to, be, to be necessary in a patient you're taking care of. Uh, but we looked at the different airway devices.